Welcome to the RISE Curriculum and Assessment webinar, part of the RISE online presentation series. Um, straight away, I'll introduce you to, welcome you to Suman, who's the chair for the session. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the second session in the RISE online presentation series, which uh, this year has replaced the RISE annual conference. My name is Suman Bhattacharji. I work at Asar Center, which is the research and assessment arm of Pratham Education Foundation in India. And it's my privilege to be, uh, to be chairing this, this session today. So as you all know, today's session focuses mainly um, on two key elements of any education system and on the links between them. The first is the curriculum, which uh, obviously specifies what teachers are expected to teach and what students are expected to learn as they move through the system. And the second is a system of learning assessments, which can provide information on whether the system is on track with regard to these expectations or whether it needs to uh, reform some aspect of the system, do something better. Um, and therefore, learning assessments can provide feedback to the system to ensure that all children do, in fact, learn. And I say um, learning assessments can provide this feedback quite deliberately, because as uh, all of our speakers this evening um, are going to discuss, the links between curriculum and assessment are really not that simple, are really not that straightforward. There are all kinds of issues. There are issues with data availability, with data quality, with whether the data speaks to curriculum objectives. Even if all of the above is true, whether there are mechanisms in place to take the learnings from a learning assessment and translate those into reforms on the ground. And so all of these elements uh, really speak directly to RISE's objective 
of um, understanding how school systems in the global south can overcome the learning crisis and deliver better learning for all children. So with that very brief um, introduction, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Um, we have Doug Johnson, who will be examining the issue of reliable, relevant learning data in India. We have two speakers who will be looking at the mismatch between curriculum expect expectations and learning outcomes. Those are Adedeji Adeniran for Nigeria and Diva Dhar for the case of India. And then we have Isaac Mubiti, who will discuss what data can tell us about whether curricular reforms in Tanzania uh, were successful in improving children's foundational um, learning outcomes. And so those are the first four speakers who all speak directly to various um, uh, issues around assessment and curriculum. The fifth speaker on our panel today, at first glance, uh, takes on a topic that is not related to the others. Um, Wayne Sandholz will be looking at whether voters reward service delivery in education. Um, as I'm sure you all see when Wayne talks about his research, understanding the political conditions that can drive or impede systems change is fundamental to being able to ensure better learning for all children. And that in its final stages of the program, RISE is looking more closely, not only at education systems themselves, but also at the context in which education happens, um, the social, institutional, historical, but importantly, the political systemic context that impacts how education systems behave. So um, without further ado, it is over to the speakers. Uh, just a quick overview of how this session is going to run. Each speaker is going to have two minutes to summarize the key findings from their research. But all of their presentations are already online on the, uh, WISE, on the RISE uh, website. And hopefully many of you have already uh, watched those or will do so after, after this session. So after all five speakers have concluded, then we will move to the question and answer uh, segment of the program where as chair, I uh, have first dibs on asking the speakers a couple of questions and then we will open up to the audience. So please feel free to write in your questions at any time during the session and we will have the speakers uh, respond to as many as uh, we are able to. So with that, it is over to the speakers. We are going to start with um, Adedeji Adeniran from the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa and RISE Nigeria, who will be speaking on, is Nigeria experiencing a learning crisis? Evidence from curriculum matched learning assessment. So over to you, Adedeji. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so, um, in our study, if we look at uh, what we did, we can situate it into the general conversation around uh, contemporary conversation around education globally, and in Nigeria, we can situate that into three areas. One is around what the chair uh, talks about in terms of uh, match or mismatch between what we call actual learning, which is what uh, an assessment uh, tools try to measure, and what is expected learning, which is what is defined in the curriculum. So uh, we try to look at what are the kind of the situation uh, uh, regarding that in Nigerian case. We also, I mean, our study also speaks to uh, the issues around uh, measuring uh, and tracking Agenda 2020 goals, especially as it regards uh, XDG4, which uh, has to do with uh, ensuring inclusive and uh, quality education for all. And the third thing we, 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 our study speak to is around the our broader education discussion around education for all, and especially leaving no one behind, and in trying to understand who have been left behind and why are they left behind in terms of drivers and dimension of exclusions that is taking place at local level. So, uh, speaking to this, in our study, uh, I mean, we, we asked different questions around uh, what is the state of the curriculum in Nigeria, and do we have an assessment tools to test it? And that is the first key uh, takeaway from our study, which has to, we speak to the fact that uh, 
data is actually a major challenge in tracking and measuring state or status of uh, agenotype, not just in Nigeria, but globally. But the good thing is that um, just like uh, we, I mean, the, the conversation that education cannot wait, assessment too cannot wait. And if assessment cannot wait, we need to be innovative about how we go about it. So these studies, uh, we, 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 we demonstrate that it is possible using uh, uh, tools that we are uh, administrators or school authorities and government already have, such as surveys, such as administrative data can make a difference in tracking changes. And that's what we did in, in the case of Nigeria, looking at uh, the uh, Nigeria Education Data Survey, which in, in, in many cases, a lot of people have um, highlighted as not being uh, speaking uh, truthfully to the state and, uh, and that uh, it overestimates the learning outcomes in Nigeria. And in this case, we try to look at matching it with curriculum, looking at to what extent does it deviate from the curriculum? And we're able to, call, I mean, show that um, we can, that can improve and speak to what is going on in terms of reality, in terms of our student learning, is there a mismatch between curriculum? And so, use, so based on what we did and uh, using this, I mean, trying to correct this kind of uh, overestimation or problem with, uh, uh, in, in, in that survey and trying to match it with the curriculum. Uh, our indicator reveals that there is indeed learning crisis in Nigeria. Majority of students are not learning and cannot cope with the minimum competence level at their grade, which speaks to the fact that uh, uh, they are not learning at the right level, if you, if, you, if, you, if you can say it like that, or that the pace of curriculum is too fast for, for learners. Also, uh, in, in the, our study identified the key excluded group to be people in the rural areas, poor, poor households, and students uh, uh, in government schools, uh, uh, as, uh, especially those in Northern Nigeria. So there's a gender, there is, uh, sorry, there is uh, a wealth dimension, there is um, also a regional uh, uh, dimension in terms of the uh, educational exclusion in Nigeria. Also the curriculum pace is over and above uh, the skill level uh, that you expected. I mean, using the estimate we have like 17%, of those in the right grade are not learning what they should be learning uh, as regards uh, literacy. And when you look at uh, uh, numeracy, uh, uh, that number increases a bit to around 31%, but uh, uh, I mean, still majority are not learning at the right level. I mean, they are not learning what the curriculum expected them to be learning as per the grade they have. And lastly, we try to look at what can be kind of uh, things that explain some of this disparity. and. One thing that's actually very strong in our analysis are the demand side factors. Parental investment, early childhood education, teachers attendance, those kind of demand factors that um, uh, uh, in, in, in some instances it has been ignored or not taken attention to. That does not say supply factor doesn't matter, but in terms of the stronger uh, uh, kind of drivers that extend some of the disparity we, we, we observe the demand side factors seem to be much more prominent and much more powerful. And that will speak to area where reform needs to focus on. So that summarizes what we did in our study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adedeji. So clearly one key lesson from what you have presented is that the conclusions are only as good as the data that is being used uh, as, the, as the basis for them. And that is a nice lead in to our next presenter, uh, who is Doug Johnson, who will be talking about assessing the assessments, learning, learning outcomes data in India. Over to Doug. Great, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bhattacharjee. Uh, and, and thanks a lot for having me on this panel. Um, so I'll be presenting some joint work uh, I did with Andres Prado, who's now with Give Directly. He was at ID Insight when he did a lot of this analysis. Um, and so to set the, the stage a little bit, in India, there's two main sources of data on learning outcomes. So you have the National Achievement Survey, which is a government-run survey um, which tests for basic learning competencies uh, and which uses a sampling-based, a school-based sampling strategy and focuses on government schools. Um, in addition, you have the ACER survey, which is a survey of basic foundational literacy and numeracy, which uses a basic household sampling strategy um, and which focuses on rural areas um, and which is implemented by the independently run uh, ACER Center, which Dr. Bhattacharji uh, helps lead. Um, and, and ACER was one of the first sort of, to our knowledge, the first major learning outcome surveys in India. 
and was pretty pivotal in calling attention to the learning crisis in India. Um, so the goal of this research is to assess the reliability of these two data sets. Uh, and we do this in two ways. Uh, so first we, we compare the two data sets to each other um, after kind of massaging the samples so that they're as similar as possible. Um, we also compare these data sets to a third data set, an independently administered household survey called the India Human Development Survey. Um, and second, we decompose the variance and changes in ACER scores into what we call a persistent component and a transitory component. Um, and we, uh, what we find is that NAS scores appear unrealistically high. Um, and, and even when you look at sort of the rankings of states, uh, according to NAS, it seems like the, um, the, the, the NAS rankings contain little information about state performance. Um, so when it comes to ACER, ACER uh, scores are reliable measures of, of, of learning outcomes, um, which we knew, but just a, a tiny bit noisier than one would expect based purely on sample size considerations. Um, so in terms of the direct implications of this for, for analysts and, and policymakers, I think you know, the first thing is people should be very careful about using NAS data because what we find is it's, it's just not very reliable. Um, and, and second, when it comes to ACER data, um, people should just be a little bit careful when comparing you know, small differences between changes in, in state averages over time or looking at district data. Um, great, thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, we're going to move now to Diva Dhar from the University of Oxford, who's also going to be talking about uh, an Indian um, a study located in India. And her study is titled Too Little Too Late, Improving Post-Primary Learning Outcomes in India. Over to Diva. Thanks and hi everyone. This paper, um, which is co-authored with Gaurav Chiplankar and Radhika Nagesh, uh, is really motivated by the issue of lo low learning levels in India, like in many other developing countries, um, something that's been one of the core of the discussion uh, in the RISE series. Um, at baseline, in our sample, we find that grade 9 students are on average still mastering skills at grades 2 and 3. We evaluate a program, uh, which is led by Avanti Fellows, uh, which combines facilitator-led instruction, technology aids, and peer learning. Uh, it's a blended learning program, specifically for maths and science uh, for students in, uh, in Chennai uh, in grade nine. It's a year-long after-school program, uh, and we find that there are significant effects on foundational math and reading skills, which compare favorably to, to other programs that have been evaluated in the literature. Um, however, um, this fails to translate into any significant uh, improvements on national grade 10 exams, uh, which are uh, standardized for, uh, for India, um, which also tests for higher level competencies and skills uh, far beyond the foundational skills that most of these students are, are still mastering. And we conclude that at the post-primary level, despite having an intensive remedial support program, uh, such intensity is still insufficient to overcome the inadequacies that students have accumulated by the time they're at the post-primary level. Um, and some of these initiatives to address the learning gap need to start earlier or require significant shift in thinking, uh, really underscoring and building the argument uh, of other research studies that show the importance of teaching at the right level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, we'll move now to our fourth speaker, who is the last of uh, speakers who are directly addressing issues of curriculum and assessment. Uh, and that is Isaac Mbiti from the University of Virginia and Rice, Tanzania, who will be speaking on evaluating curriculum reforms in developing countries, evidence from Tanzania. Over to you, Isaac. Thank you very much. It's really great to uh, be here and thanks to all the attendees. We see we have many, many people who are signing in from all over the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, so today I am going to present uh, just a summary of our paper. This is joint work with Daniel uh, Rodriguez Segura, who's a, a great PhD student here at University of Virginia. So look out for him in a few years when he's on the job market, if the job market comes back. It's a little doom and gloom joke. Um, so just to summarize, what we're going to do here is um, look at 
the recent, in 2015, um, curriculum reform that uh, Tanzania sort of uh, instituted. And uh, so the big picture motivation of this uh, study is basically uh, fits in line with sort of what the other speakers were discussing, which is, you know, their concerns about uh, curriculum um, in many developing countries that are sort of quote unquote uh, over ambitious. That is, um, they are set at a level that's a little bit uh, higher than uh, the median student, for example. Right? And so, and there are many reasons for this. One is sort of elite bias in terms of um, the sort of curriculum sort of objectives and standards being set to the level of the, um, the political elite rather than sort of the, the median student. Um, so that's, so what this uh, uh, reform did was essentially uh, roll back a lot of the sort of uh, curriculum uh, and sort of just focus it on um, the foundational skills. And um, there's limited evidence about sort of these curriculum uh, simplifications, uh, at an, especially at the national level. So we have a lot of evidence from smaller studies, smaller RCTs looking at, um, you know, teaching at the right level type of interventions. But there's, you know, limited, I would say, there's, you know, there's, there's some, I would say there's none, but there are, there are sort of the smaller set that look at sort of national reforms. And so what we're going to do here is look at, as I said, the 2015 um, reform. Um, what this did was... Uh, simplified the curriculum in grade one and two specifically. Um, and, you know, prior to this reform, grade one and two, you were studying maybe nine different subjects. You were studying math, English, Kiswahili. You were studying computer science or technology, so to speak, uh, agriculture, vocational skills, uh, geography, you know, those, all these subjects, nine different subjects you were studying. And so what they did was uh, eliminate all but two. Essentially, we're going to study just uh, numeracy and literacy in Kiswahili and uh, just math, right? So that's all you're studying. And they're incorporating some of the other subjects into like the Kiswahili. So you'll learn a little bit of science, you'll read a science passage in, in the Kiswahili, for, for example. Um, and so what we do here is, um, at least in this first part, um, which I want to just discuss, is we are going to use data from 60 schools, which is were part of a, a different um, study that we were conducting over this time period. Uh, so it's national representative sample. We're going to look at grades one, two, three, and we're going to use a difference in difference approach where we're going to take, uh, we're going to think of group grade one and two as a treated group and grade three as sort of the control group. There are some assumptions we have to make about parallel trends and things like that, which we test for and show that we're, we're okay. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this data is we have item level data in math, English, and Kiswahili, and uh, we can do some things about sort of trying to sort of equate the test to make sure that they're all about the same. Um, and essentially what we do there is we, we find that um, using this difference in difference approach, the reform increased uh, learning outcomes in literacy and numeracy across the board. And so one of the concerns that um, people raised is, you know, potentially that if you sort of pare down the curriculum, that might actually hurt students who are at the top of the distribution of before, right? So, um, but in this, what we find is no evidence of that. So basically everyone benefits from this, um, at least in the short run. Um, there's no differential treatment effect. So boys and girls benefit as much, uh, equally. Uh, schools in rural and urban areas benefit equally, so which is interesting as well. Um, and we also see some evidence of uh, the importance of implementation, whereas, um, schools that had more trained teachers or the presence of trained teachers in trained teachers in this uh, reform that is uh, so there was a cascading sort of um, a training program that sort of spread out the training across the country so teacher if you had a teacher if you were in a school that had a teacher that was trained in this reform uh, you, you, you the sort of uh, test scores were much higher um, and so overall what we, we, we argue is that this is sort of consistent with the idea that uh, you know, if we sort of pare down and focus uh, the curriculum a little bit, uh, then that could actually help uh, students across the board. Um, the I think open question is, you know, yes, we show you early, you know, learning gains in the, in the short run, how would this sort of um, play out in the long run? That's, I think, a, a different question that we'll need more data to sort of, to, to answer. But thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, it is really hard to summarize all of this research in two minutes. I'm sorry to have to rush you all through it, but hopefully everyone will go and look at the online presentations. So moving now to our fifth and last speaker of the day, uh, Wayne Sandholz from the University of California, San Diego, talking about do voters reward service delivery, experimental evidence from Liberia. Over to you, Wayne. Thanks so much. And, uh, 
as, as Suman mentioned, uh, you know, this panel is about curriculum and assessment, and my paper is uh, kind of zooming way out and looking at assessments of the education system in a very broad sense. Um, now, my question is, if our research and evidence is going to help kids learn, at some point, policymakers have to decide to adopt it. In democracies, at least, can, the voters can theoretically pressure politicians to improve schooling. Um, so it's important not just to know if voters care about education, but if they even perceive uh, when education improves and if they reward those who are responsible with their votes. Um, a randomized Liberian school reform provided a rare and, and valuable opportunity to do just that. Uh, and the, the reform in previous uh, research of mine with, uh, co-authored with Justin Senefer and Mauricio Romero, um, we showed that this reform did improve student test scores and uh, teacher attendance. Um, but my paper shows that in spite of that, it caused a reduction in vote share for the incumbent party's candidate in uh, the subsequent election that happened about a year after the reform was implemented. So uh, the survey that I ran uh, among teachers suggested that this had to do at least partly with opposition from teachers um, who the treatment made less likely to support the incumbent party uh, and to participate in electoral activities. However, uh, heterogeneity in the treatment effect shows that voters were highly attuned to changes in school quality. So because the treatment was randomized within pairs of similar schools matched on ex-ante observables, um, I can measure how treatment affected voting patterns all along the distribution of learning treatment effects. And what I find is that the reform caused electoral losses for the incumbent precisely in the places where the treatment had a small or a negative effect on test scores. In places where the treatment ended up causing a very big gain in test scores, it also caused a big gain in the vote share for the incumbent party. And so, you know, it, it'll surprise no one that, uh, you know, meaningful reform is often impossible without alienating certain interested constituencies. Uh, and I do find evidence of that in my paper showing that this big school reform even while it was successful on many of the dimensions that are important to us as researchers, uh, this, you know, these the big school reforms can be politically risky. But uh, I also show that even in a young democracy like Liberia, uh, voters are paying attention to educational quality and education reform can pay off for politicians if it works well enough. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wayne. Um... Thank you to all five speakers, and we'll move now to the Q&A session uh, for this um, session. And I'm going to kick off that the Q&A by asking all of our five speakers to reflect on a question that hasn't so much to do with the outcomes of their own research, but we'll really I'm asking them to step back and think a little bit more broadly about the implications for the links between curriculum and assessment in the countries that they were studying. So, and the question is this. So as researchers, we all do understand the importance of data and measurement. But if we think about assessment literacy as a series of capabilities, first, you need to know that you need data to answer a question that you have. And by you, I mean an education system needs to know, needs to understand that it needs data to answer a question. This is often a, um, something that is not true in many countries of the global south, and we are not used to evidence-based decision-making. Even if you do accept that you need data, you still need to design a system where your assessment tools and processes actually speak to the kinds of questions that you need data about. So this is where the whole idea about assessment and curriculum speaking to each other uh, becomes very important. Now, even if you have a system like that in place, then you need people who understand what the data is telling you and are able to translate that data into actual reforms on the ground to improve whatever it is that needs improving. And finally, um, let's say we have all of those elements in place, you still need, as Wayne has just pointed out, ways of ensuring that key constituencies in your country back the reforms that are being implemented. So stepping back from the research that each of you has done, what would you identify as the most important implications of your research for improving what I'm calling assessment literacy levels of the education system in the specific country context where this research was um, located? So uh, maybe we'll start with um, Adedeji. Do you want to take a first crack? 
Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, so in the context of what you have highlighted and uh, the narration you uh, mentioned um, about trying to, uh, I mean, the first step uh, you mentioned, so our research uh, speak to the first two, one in terms of um, how, I mean, how do we measure performance? And um, if we have this data set, uh, what, what should be of interest in this? I mean, uh, and what we, what we try to do is to look at um, uh, the extent of mismatch, but not just that uh, who had been left behind and the rest. Uh, but to, to, to deepen the conversation further, what are the implications of, ass uh, of assessment and learning? Uh, for me, I think the, 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 the implication is that um, there is need for this, uh, decentralization of assessment. Um, I mean, if we take it to the extreme, um, if we, if we uh, I, I mean, the consensus that's, I mean, in this uh, discussion and in the literature is that learning at the right level, at the right level is the way to go. It means that assessment uh, function is more and is more needed in the hands of teachers and in the hands of parents who can actually look at, okay, my kids or my uh, students, this is the level at which they are. And for that reason, this is what they need to learn. So we need to decentralize mm -hmm. assessment. It's not much more about uh, comparing um, a country or developing country that are far behind. It's about kids that mm -hmm left behind and what we can do. So we need to give uh, these assessment tools to the key actors that can actually be the change agents, like parents, like teachers, that can actually understand that, okay, uh, uh, where these kids are, and this is what we can do to improve learning. Thank you, Adeleji. Um, Diva, do you wonder, I mean, uh, Adeleji has talked about decentralizing assessments and putting data and assessments in the hands of people closer to the children. Uh, for the case of India, Diva, do you want to, do you agree? Would you, do you have something to add to that? Uh, do you want to disagree? Over to you. Yeah, I think what I, I just wanted to add from the Indian context, and this also speaks to some of uh, Doug's work, is that not only do you need timely, regular assessments, you also need credible assessments that actually have action linked to them. Um, what my research and data is showing that if you don't have credible assessments, you end up in a situation where you have kids who are going for grades nine and grade 10 and who are still mastering skills uh, that are, you know, include reading a story or doing division. So they're so far behind that at that point, you know, a credible assessment in grade 10 is just, it's just too late to actually take any action. Um, and I think the, this move in India to, to delay assessments, to not have credible assessments uh, is going to, has backfired and is something that should be, should be reformed um, further. And um, I am, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Diva. Um, Doug, you also situated your study in India. Uh, do you want to add anything to what Diva has um, is suggesting for the case of India? Yeah, and I think my, my comments flow, I'll, I'll echo what, what Diva and DJ said. My comments are, are very similar in nature. Um, and before I dive in, I should, uh, yeah, to, so I, I spoke about the implications of the research for, for data use. Um, the, the, you know, there, there's uh, the, the other implications of, of the, the research that we did are more just about like the, the data ecosystem in, in India. Um, and I should mention, I hope that none of these comments are interpreted as any as a criticism of ACER. I think ACER has done a phenomenal job, especially of highlighting the learning crisis in India. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, if, you, if you accept the results and they are you know, not peer reviewed yet, but the, the results suggest that mass isn't particularly useful. You know, ACER is not collected in urban areas. And uh, it, it, um, what we find is that it, it's not, uh, you have to be a little bit careful when using changes in ACER state scores over time. Um, so if you accept those results, the, the, the you know, follow on implication is that th there are certain things we, we can't do in India in terms of evaluation, looking at changes in state scores uh, or district scores uh, right now with the data that we have available. Um, and I think now is the time with the, the recently announced National Mission for Foundational Literacy and Numeracy and this, uh, this big push 
on foundational learning skills to think about what data, what more data we, we should be collecting in India. Um, and I think that's, that's probably where the research, the implications for my research stop, but you encourage us to speculate. So I'll speculate a little bit more, uh, which goes beyond the findings of my research. So this is more personal opinion. Um, but, but I would say, uh, you know, my personal opinion is I, I think India should be considering three things. Um, you know, one, one, I think it'd be useful to launch, a, you know, big national household survey of learning outcomes, which is both rural and urban, includes government and, and private schools, administered by full-time paid field staff with a large sample size. And I think that would address, you know, some of the, 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 the data um, uh, ecosystem things that I talked about earlier, um, at least at the state level. Um, now to go lower than the state level, to go to the district level, to go to the school level, I think is much more difficult. Um, to, to get there, and I, it, I think it's gonna take longer, but I think the, the path there will probably, I think it, it's useful to pursue two different potential paths. One is improving summative assessments, which are administered in a lot of states of the, you know, usually like twice a year, a lot of interesting work going into improving those. I do think it's gonna take a long time before the quality of those data are reliable enough for any sort of evaluation or, or use in an initiative. <clears throat> Um, and third, I think um, what would be useful to consider, and I'd love to pick Isaac's brain about this later, because I know that this is something I think that Tanzania has done. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but, but um, considering some sort of census-based board type exam in earlier grades. Um, so currently, you know, India has a, has a board at the 10th grade level and at the 12th grade level. Um, you know, a lot of people don't make it to those boards. They're also, as Diva's research shows, they're not good for distinguishing across the broad spectrum of learning outcomes, the, the, the full distribution of student levels. They're really good at distinguishing between good students and really good students. Um, so, so potentially like a, a board that was more focused on basic learning skills, foundational skills administered in an earlier grade would, would really, that could potentially provide data, not just at the district level, but all the way down to the school level which opens up a lot more possibilities in terms of the types of initiatives you could do. <clears throat> um, yeah, sorry, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm... <laughs> um, thanks. Um, I think there are going to be quite a few questions uh, from the audience and we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. Uh, but I did have one more question that I wanted to ask really quickly. And this stems from Wayne's research. Uh, where Wayne is really talking about the ways in which the best laid plans for educational reform can go astray if key groups of stakeholders have a different set of priorities. Um, so while Wayne looked at teachers and teacher unions and how their identity as teacher, as unionized teachers um, influenced their behavior as voters, um, my question to all of you is what about other groups of stakeholders? For example, what about parents? Uh, very often parents have a very clear view of what they think good education is teaching at the right level may not conform to that view at all. So how should an education system act to take other key stakeholders along on any process of reform uh, based on the research, I just speculating around the research that each of you have done, but maybe we'll start with Wayne who gave us, uh, told us about what the problem is. Uh, maybe you can speculate a little bit on what the solution might be, Wayne. Sure, yeah, thanks Suman for that uh, very thoughtful question. Um, and uh, I, I think, I, I guess my answer actually ties in a bit to your previous question also, which was that, you know, my, my research, I, I have to admit, I was a bit surprised uh, to find the gradient that I did, you know, between um, I, the positive correlation in uh, voters uh, support for the incumbent and how well the, uh, the program worked um, at improving test scores. And uh, this is, you know, this again is a bit speculative, but uh, I think that a big part of, of the reason for this, I think a big part of the reason that, uh, that parents were able to perceive where the program did well uh, is that kind of a, a big predictor of improved test scores was improved teacher attendance. And uh, this, you know, even in a place like Liberia, where uh, many parents are, you know, less well educated than, than their own children, which I know is the case in many parts of, of the world. Um, something basic like this is that uh, parents can tell when when teachers are showing up to school, and so I think uh, you know the, the the thorny issues that uh, that Suman highlighted in uh, you know this really useful concept of assessment literacy are are tough to get around. Um, but I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit uh, in things like 
improving teacher attendance. And uh, this is where we get into the thorny issues of Simon's second question, which is that uh, you know, efforts to improve teacher attendance oftentimes are met with, with opposition from teachers, from teachers' unions. Um, but uh, I, I do think, I guess one, one ray of hope I find, one point of hope in, in, in my paper is that, uh, that parents do notice these kind of things and they're able to uh, attribute credit to you know, politicians who are willing to uh, you know, provide the political leadership, if you want to call it that, to uh, you know, make changes that may um, shake up the system a bit, but that ultimately uh, redound to the benefit of the kids. And something like uh, I think teacher attendance is uh, is a nice place to start. And uh, you know, if if we start in a place like that, I I I imagine again, this is this is speculative, and I'm no politician, uh, but I would hope, and and I think my research at least at least you know supports this hope. Uh, that parents can get behind reforms like this if it's something simple that they can understand where they can see the benefits pretty clearly. Thank you very much, Wayne. That was a very thoughtful uh, response. We're going to move now to, I think there are quite a few questions coming in from the audience. Um, so we're going to move now to some of those. And the first one, which um, we're going to ask Adereji and maybe Doug as well to try to address is um, even with better and more reliable data, how can we ensure accountability and transparency? How are governments held accountable to clearly represent what is happening at the local levels based on their data? So Adereji, do you want to uh, go first? Thank you. Um, so, how do we uh, engender uh, accountability with assessments? And I think, um, like, like I mentioned earlier, um, it's about getting it to, um, uh, to the right kind of hands, to the right people, and using it to uh, frame the conversation around education system. Because I mean, um, uh, to be frank with you, both government and parents and communities are aware that education is in the bad states. Um, are, are they aware how bad it is? I mean, they have a sense of it. Um, but maybe what is actually not so clear is um, where the problems are and uh, also to what extent are they lagging behind in terms of what their intervention or what their role could be or what even uh, maybe you as a parent going to school, monitoring, or what you could do to improve this kind of uh, uh, outcomes. That maybe that's what is uh, a little bit lacking and maybe a concrete way to say this is this uh, uh, extent of that. So I think, um, like I said, decentralizing assessment and ensuring that uh, we have it much more closer to the uh, uh, local context, not just at, uh, at the national level, but at the state level, at the local level, at the community level, at school level, might be uh, crucial because then uh, parents who have access to this, also like uh, civil societies and uh, people that actually who frame the conversation around trying to tell government uh, about what is going on, they will use this kind of tools uh, to demand accountability. But without a, uh, I mean, without a firm evidence, uh, you could not actually uh, uh, ask for accountability. So uh, assessment would, uh, I mean, feed into the value chain of demanding for accountability. It will uh, uh, embody uh, uh, civil society to, 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 to demand for it. It will enhance, uh, I mean, parents to know the condition and state of things. And it also could be a rallying uh, kind of uh, cry for, stakeholders within the system to say, okay, this is, I mean, to, to form a conversation. Because if we don't know where we are, we cannot improve it. I mean, uh, what, you, what, what, you, what you don't know, I mean, what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. And so assessment is crucial to start the conversation around what next. And if we don't, if, if we, if we don't ask that question about where we are, we might not be able to actually deeply discuss and uh, shed light on what next. Also, um, I mean, assessment, when, when, we, when we dish our figure from assessment, say a lot of people are not learning, uh, it might not come close to individuals. I mean, I as a person, I, uh, my kids might be learning, so it might not relate to me. 
So it also needs to be something that speaks to uh, 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 reality of each individual, which means uh, we need, we, we, uh, every individual needs to uh, not be part of the assessment itself, but I mean, need to be part of uh, uh, the value chain in terms of when we have this assessment, who would use it? I mean, assessment for what? And that's why we need to define the function of assessment very well. Uh, when we need, to, when it will be used as a tool for government, or will it be a, a tool to demand accountability or change by uh, okay. demand side actors? Okay. I'm gonna sorry to interrupt, but I would like a few other of the speakers to answer as well. Doug, do you want to take a brief crack at that question so we can? Okay. Move on? Uh, yeah. I'll, 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 um, sure. Okay. Yeah, um, so, and, and I, I think. I very much agree with Dejay. I think you mentioned the phrase start a conversation. I, I, I very much agree with that. Like, you know, the link between data and accountability is much more tenuous than we would like, uh, you know. Um, and I think, you know, Pratham's early work uh, um, that, uh, you know, the written up in the pitfalls of participatory programs paper um, really shows this, where, where you guys shared results, we, we shared the results from the ACER tests of students in the village with parents um, that had these conversations with the parents with the hope that the parents would mobilize to improve the schools. And unfortunately, there was a lot of other things about the program that worked. The volunteers were amazing, but that particular piece of the program didn't have much of an effect, didn't have an effect. Um, and I think that shows that, you know, the, 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 the route from data to accountability is, is a long, tortuous path. Um, I, I think what Deji said, like starting a conversation, if you don't have data, it's very hard to have the accountability, you, you, you know, um, without it, you can be sure there's gonna be very little accountability. Um, and, and I'd also say that, you know, accountability is just one use of data. You can use data just for general management, not, not to use it as a cudgel to, to kind of under, to give people feedback. You can use data to evaluate programs. Um, so so I, I, I think we, uh, undermine the value of data if we look at it just from the lens of accountability. In fact, stressing the, the accountability angle too much can be a little bit harmful in that if, if I, I see this a lot in uh, senior government officials, they want accountability of everybody below them, not them. They want the data totally feeding up to them and they want to, you know, um, uh, uh, dole out punishments based on people's performance. And, and if you start from that premise, you're probably not going to get good data and it's going to be a waste of exercise. Thank you, Doug. Um, moving to another question, and this question comes from Anya Nias. Um, what can be done to review and revise curricular goals to meet the needs of the students today, specifically with a focus on developing foundational literacy skills? And what are the main obstacles to curricular reorientation? Uh, maybe this time we'll start with Isaac. You want to take a first cut at that? Isaac? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I think um, what we're seeing right now is I think a push to, in many different countries to reforming curriculum. Um, and I think what you're seeing is uh, a lot of countries taking on what, so what, you know, what they're calling sort of competency-based curriculum um, I think, um, you know, so there's a push, I think, around the world to sort of re-look at and sort of take a closer look at curriculum. Um, so this is a good time to actually think broadly about this, this issue. Um, what um, I think is important is, um, you know, Sort of taking sort of a broader picture and saying, okay, well, you know, what what is, what do we want to sort of get out? What do we want our students to learn, right? And what what are sort of the key things that we need them to learn and understand and understand well? Um, but also being cognizant of uh, so there's that aspirational aspect of it, but there's also a practical aspect that you sort of have to think about, you know, the pacing, the sort of structure, the sequence, you know. You know, should we teach this first, teach that first, how these things come, you know, the complementarities between some of these things, you know, you need to learn how to sort of understand language before you can actually understand math sometimes, because if you don't understand the instructions, you can't really understand much. So, so there's all these things that are very complex that you sort of have to understand. Um, and then how do you train the teachers, right? So, so there's all these things that sort of come into play when you're thinking about, um, so there's no easy answer here, I think. It's just that uh, I think the main 
thing I would say is it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. And one of the things that I worry about in seeing sort of these uh, reforms that are sort of ongoing right now is just like, you know, they're to me seem, you know, really, really rushed or at least um, moving at a speed that's a little bit faster than I would think would, would be good in the sense of I think, you know, piloting and sort of trying things out a little bit, working with teachers and teachers training colleges, you know, just working out all these kinks takes, it takes a lot of time. And then sort of building up then the assessments at the same time to sort of pair, uh, monitor and sort of see how kids are doing. I think it takes a long time to roll these things up. So, so I would just say patience and it takes time and you have to do your work um, to actually get these things to sort of align and sort of be, you know, to, to sort of work well. Um, but yeah, it's, just, it's, a lot of work. Yeah. Thank you, Isaac. So patience, time, and we should all do what we need to do. Um, Diva, do you want to add to uh, this question? Do you want to add to what Isaac was saying? I actually very much agree with what Isaac was saying. I think, you know, even in India, there have been waves of curricular reform, often very political and debated for other reasons, apart from just um, this level of skills. But I, I do think it needs to be a thoughtful piloted process uh, in consultation with a wide number of stakeholders. And the, align the assessments that are, are being held in schools need to be really aligned with what the reality is uh, on the ground for, for many people. What's nice about you know, structures like teaching at the right level is you're not necessarily restricting people to specific curriculum uh, and details. And I think piloting and scaling up programs that can really help build skills um, and you know, detach curriculum from what's actually happening at the school level may also be uh, other areas to consider. That's something that Pratham and Asar has, of course, been leading on. So oh, uh, I think that's a good note for, <laughs> to, for me to, uh, we're going to conclude this segment of the Q&A and uh, move to a few questions that for Wayne specifically. So, so far we've been talking about the curriculum and assessment pieces and the links between them. But there are also some questions on this other piece which Wayne has brought out, which is the political economy piece of, uh, to do with the surrounding political uh, conditions that enable or impede reforms. So Wayne, for you, there's a, a specific question. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the role of teachers first? Was the teacher's response to the reform mediated by or amplified by teachers' unions? Um, second, could your findings be a reflection of the neglect of teachers in education policy development initiatives? So could you take a crack at those questions, please? Sure, yeah, um, these are great questions. And uh, the, yeah, I mean, I guess to, to I'll, I know we're running short on time, so I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, to the first question, um, what is the role of uh, of teachers and specifically like how did the union seem to mediate teachers responses to this reform? Uh, I do find that uh, I guess, you know, so, so the teacher survey that I ran um, found uh, that teachers in treated schools were slightly less likely to say that they um, supported and, and planned to vote for the incumbent uh, government candidate for president um, on in general. Uh, but when I when you only look at unionized teachers in both the treated and control schools, I find a very large effect. So um, so kind of the the negative impact that the treatment had on um, teachers' uh, views and attitudes toward the incumbent government uh, seems to really have been concentrated uh, in in unionized teachers. And it seems that something about uh, this reform uh, really kind of activated. Uh, these, you know, kind of unionized teachers' um, anti-government attitudes uh, more in in treated schools uh, where they where they experienced it directly, right? Um, the second question is, uh, if I remember right, um, you know, could could this could this reaction have something to do with you know neglect of teachers in designing the reform? I think absolutely. Um, the I guess the perhaps the irony here is that uh, the um, the, the particular reform uh, that I study, uh, which was a, a public-private school partnership, um, it, it was very similar to what we would think of as like a charter school program in the U.S. And the designers of this policy uh, were were worried that that teachers would, uh, you know, would um, oppose the policy, and uh, perhaps rightly so, and uh, you know, 
the subsequent research that we did found that a lot of the worries of at least some of the worries of the policy, uh, some of the worries of opponents of the policy were well founded, right? Um, and so the policy was designed to incorporate unionized government teachers, uh, the the private school providers who were brought in, uh, you know, to take over management of government schools were required to continue employing um, only, you know, uh, civil servant teachers, uh, government teachers. Uh, but, uh, you know, despite that, uh, it wasn't enough. And it seems to have the, the, the National uh, Teachers Union strongly opposed the policy. And um, I, I'm not sure what the takeaway from that is. Uh, maybe there's no way to please everyone. And so, um, you know, policy designers should uh, just uh, plant their flag and, uh, and trust in, in their instincts. Or, um, or maybe, you know, the opposite um, conclusion could, uh, could be valid too, which is that the designers of this policy could have done more to reach out to teachers to make sure that they, uh, the teacher union would be on board. Um, because I didn't design the policy, uh, I, I wish I could say more about kind of which of those directions to go, but um, definitely I think uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's undeniable that um, getting, getting teachers on board with school reforms uh, is vital to try and make sure that they'll be able to um, not only you know, work in the short run, but also be viable in the long run. I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much, Wayne. And um, we are pretty much out of time, but if I'm going to ask you one last question, and you're going to need to answer it in about one minute, uh, if you can. And the question is from Rapul Chaudhary What are some incentives that typically work well for polit political or state leadership to prioritize education outcomes for students? So, if you could just really briefly uh, comment, respond to that question, please. Yeah, um, it's a great question. Uh, and uh, honestly, it's a bit beyond the scope of, of my research. Um, my, my research focuses on whether elections can function as one of these incentives for political and state leaders. Um, and uh, I, I guess my conclusion is um, that tentatively, uh, you know, hopeful that elections can kind of provide this, uh, this incentive. But I think there's definitely a lot more research to do about when and where elections really do kind of have, have this disciplining effect on uh, leaders at such a, at such a high up level. So I, you know, I, I hope to study more about this. Thanks very much, Wayne. And thank you to all our speakers. Uh, we are pretty much out of time. So just as we conclude the session, uh, I'm going to invite Louise Crouch to give a concluding um, comment. And then we'll have a wrap up uh, from Carmen Belafi, who is a research associate for the RISE program uh, on behalf of RISE. So Louise, over to you. Yeah, just a very, very quick comment that um, on this issue of data and accountability and the tenuous link uh, between it, between those two, which Doug referred to, I think, I think one has to think in a very disaggregated way uh, about what kinds of accountability and for what kinds of things. So, for example, in one case that I studied, um, it, through a random sample survey that was not meant at accountability or not meant at localized sort of parental voice-based accountability, the survey found out that teachers were simply forgetting to teach skip counting to the early grades. And if you don't do skip counting very well, you're not gonna learn multiplication very easily. And that was corrected through bureaucratic means, just basically a circular. And it's not a very effortful thing. I mean, it, you just have to do it. Um, on the other hand, if the schools are performing shoddily overall, and you have an accountability system based on local voice, then you, know, you probably do have to move toward uh, more uh, census-like assessments, maybe simpler, maybe not as deep, but more census-like. So I think there are all kinds of trade-offs here between what it's for, what is the type of accountability, how much money you have and, and so on. So, so I guess a plea for all of us to understand and agree that there is, if there's one area where the adage that not one size fits all, it's, it's, it's here. It really depends on purpose, the purpose of the measurement and the type of accountability that you're gonna be using it for, where there is bureaucratic accountability, professional accountability, market-based accountability, communitarian accountability, and so on. That's all. Thank you very much for that concluding comment, Luis. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Carmen to wrap up on behalf of 
a RISE program. Thank you very much again to all our speakers. Carmen, over to you. Thank you, Suman, uh, and thank you for this really fantastic discussion. So as Suman said, I am a part of a team that um, works with the RISE uh, Research Directorate. And in that capacity, I would just like to give a few concluding remarks about the broader RISE perspective on the topics discussed today. Uh, so as you know, at RISE, we care a lot about the system perspective of education. And I believe that this panel was a really great example of how individual studies and findings can be linked back to more overarching questions of how to improve systems of education. So I would just like to very quickly highlight three things from, from this panel today. The first, and this may seem rather obvious, but as Suman highlighted in her introduction, is not as straightforward, which is that to combat the learning crisis, we need regular, relevant, and reliable data on learning. Um, and education systems should be evaluated, among other factors, on how much learning they produce. Um, but all too often, that is not the case. So learning is not measured or not measured well enough. So we don't have reliable data on what children are learning or how they're learning in their learning profiles. So it's often said that what doesn't get measured doesn't get fixed. Uh, and in order to fix learning, we need to measure it and measure it well. The second point that I'd like to highlight is especially what has come out of, of Isaac's um, findings is this incoherence between the curriculum and children's actual learning levels. And this incoherence within the education system contributes to low, learn low learning and children being left behind. Um, and so this happens with overambitious curricula when children fall behind and the earlier they fall behind, the harder it will be for them to catch up. They may stop learning altogether or may drop out even as a result of that. But teachers can also be put in a very tough position in that where catering to children's needs and their skill levels and completing the curriculum may be competing and adverse mutually exclusive expectations on them. So in order for children to learn, they need to be taught at the level they're at so they can build foundational skills and then use those as solid foundations to build higher order skills on top of that. So it's about teaching at the right level, but also teaching at the right stage. And the third quick remark I'd want to make is very straight, in a very straightforward way that there is so much more to be uncovered about the politics of learning. Um, and RISE is looking more closely now at the broader context and system determinants of learning and the political conditions, especially. So we know that governments, um, have improved schooling and increased schooling massively around the globe in the recent decades, but there doesn't seem to be a similar commitment to learning. Um, and that is a big puzzle for us. Um, and today's discussion has offered some great new insights into how to even shape political will or state society relations. Um, and that is a crucial step in understanding the politics of learning better. And all of that goes to say political economy and politics of learning are areas which RISE will be more vocal about in the coming years as well. So with that, um, before we, um, we conclude, let me say a few word of, words of, of thanks on behalf of the RISE program. First of all, to all of our fantastic panelists, thank you so much for, for participating. Uh, to our fantastic chair, Suman Bhattacharji, for uh, leading and facilitating this session. And not least to all the people working tirelessly behind the scenes on event planning, logistics, IT, to make this event happen and run smoothly. A big thank you to all of you. And lastly, a quick service announcement. Uh, the RISE online series will continue exactly a week from today on Thursday, the 30th of July, with a panel on teachers and the teaching profession. So please register for this event if you're interested. Many thanks to all of you for watching, uh, for your continued interest in RISE and in education research. So we will hope you will tune in again next week. And until then, take care and goodbye. <laughs>